We are the beloved of God. Let us open our hearts to him. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On this feast of Corpus Christi, it's perhaps good to ask, what is it that our Lord is up to when he calls us to the Eucharist with him? And there is one thing that we're all agreed about, regardless of our ecclesiastical tradition. That is that it is Jesus who calls us here. It is Jesus who took the bread, broke it, gave thanks and shared it, and said, do this to remember me. At that great covenant meal about which we've just heard, the Last Supper, Jesus tells us to do Eucharist. But we need to remember that the Last Supper itself was not a Eucharist. If we get this wrong, we very easily end up with some kind of memorial service for dead Jesus. In the scriptures, the Eucharist only happens as part of the unfolding of the resurrection, as part of the revelation of the risen Christ. The Eucharist is an Easter appearance of the risen Lord. And the Eucharist is only ever presided over by the risen Lord. And so, the Eucharist, sisters and brothers, is how Jesus does Easter with us. During the Easter season, just concluded, you'll remember that we rehearsed the many ways that people experienced the risen Lord. There's a story, for example, about the risen Lord walking with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize the Lord, even though they were talking all the way and their hearts were burning within them. What a story. They didn't recognize him until he made himself known in the breaking of the bread. And then he came to share breakfast with the fishermen disciples at their lakeside campfire. Once again, they saw who Jesus was in this act of eating and breaking and thanking and sharing. And it didn't take long before the church realized that Jesus' habit of sharing food with people has become a thing, an ongoing thing, a sign of the risen Christ. As the first Christians learned to live into the Easter experience, the gospel exp experiences of Jesus in his risen, uh, as the risen Lord, are always a bit ambiguous. You remember, you can walk all the way to Emmaus without recognizing him. Or if you're Mary Magdalene, you can think he's the gardener. Or if you're Thomas, you can meet him in an upper room and still be not quite sure. Jesus' risen presence is just like that. And it's like that in the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, Jesus makes Easter happen for us. The risen Lord makes himself present to take and thank, break and share bread with us. Once those early Christians kind of got it about the Eucharist, 
the penny also dropped that of course the risen Lord was going to turn up at a meal time. It's famously said that Jesus was crucified because of the people he sat down to eat with. And the Gospels record how Jesus stepped over those boundaries of ritual purity or racial or religious prejudice. He always sat down to eat with the wrong people. Eating in that culture being a seriously intimate social interaction. But Jesus' good news from God was imaged by him as an open table at which all are welcome and where the distinctions of gender and culture, religion and hierarchy are abolished. The first, last, the last, first, and so on. The outsiders have become the insiders. The insiders, sadly, have walked out. But God's hospitality is imaged as an open table in which there's plenty for everyone. Everyone will be fed as the gospel miracle stories explain. Everyone will be stuffed full of the good things of God. And the more you share the bread of Jesus, the more there is to share. The feeding of multitudes is possible because this bread is bread from heaven, Jesus says, the bread of life. And this bread is the risen Lord himself. So we've followed the thread of some of what Jesus might be up to when he calls us here. He's calling us to a table where everyone's welcome. Everyone's honoured, everyone has a voice. Rich, poor, gay, straight, black, white, angelic or naughty, everyone is welcome. And he's calling us to a table where the inner circle of disciples are fed only in order that they might, in their turn, feed multitudes. It's only in the sharing of God's bread that they themselves discover the miracle of having enough and to spare. It's only in being outward facing towards the social other that we discover who we are in the heart of God's banquet and to discover that this banquet images the way God wants the whole world to be. And Jesus is calling us to a covenant table where the covenant of God's love and our response is consummated, completed in the intimacy of communion. In communion, the bread of life, the food of heaven, transforms us into itself as we become bread for the hungry world, as we become life in the world, life givers. There are lots of papal encyclicals and Anglican treatises about the conditions required for a valid Eucharist. That may be a new notion to those of you who haven't done theology, but you could have an invalid Eucharist. Would you believe it? You have to have the right sort of priest the right sort of words, the right sort of intention, the right sort of bread and wine and so on. There are whole books about it. But I think for Jesus, a valid Eucharist is one where you have the right sort of guests who are, of course, the wrong sort. And for Jesus, I think a valid Eucharist is one where the disciples are gathered to be fed in order to go feed someone else. Only then is this meal 
truly part of the covenant we have with God, a meal that's truly a holy communion. There's a treasured gospel reading in John that tells us the story about the raising of Lazarus just before the events of Jesus' own resurrection. You remember, Jesus turns up at a funeral and all the professional mourners are weeping and wailing and we're told that Jesus was disturbed. And I've been reading recently that scholars are saying the word that's used there for being disturbed is actually about being a bit cranky and angry, not just sad and uh, full of grief himself. A sort of disturbed, angry Jesus walks into the crowd of people who are wallowing in the culture of death and the meaninglessness of everything and the hopelessness of everything. And instead of joining in, Jesus just disrupts the whole thing, which is pretty typical of the way Jesus used to behave when death tries to have the last word. He raises Jesus. That's pretty disruptive. That raises Lazarus. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And when we read it that way, we realize this is a word of protest, a word of prophecy against the culture of death, a word of prophecy and protest being proclaimed into the world that leans towards death. At every funeral, as at the grave of Lazarus, the priest stands in the shoes of Jesus to say, enough already, I am the resurrection and the life. And in the Eucharist, Perhaps we're standing together in the shoes of Jesus. Or should we say, Jesus is standing in our shoes to disrupt the culture around us, the culture of death and murder and destruction and vengeance, the dark side. And that Jesus is standing in our shoes to make that declaration and prophecy against it. I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. So the Eucharist is where Jesus does Easter with us and for us, truly present in that ambiguous, mysterious way. And as it was for the first disciples, he'll be disruptive but he'll also be beautiful. He won't be obvious, yet he will be completely obvious once the bread is broken. Let's move on now to break the bread of God. Blessed, praised and adored be Jesus Christ on his throne of glory and in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen.